Hello and welcome to episode five of the Don't Change Much podcast. I am your host, Dan Murphy. Today's episode is titled Better Health Starts With a Conversation. So who better to talk to about this subject than a guy who has made a career out of having great conversations? Longtime broadcaster turned keynote speaker, Riaz Medji. Now, before we get into things, we must thank the Jack and Darlene Poole Foundation because without their generous gift, the Don't Change Much podcast would not be possible. So a huge thank you. How many of us have missed the chance to have an important conversation with someone we care about because we didn't know how to start it or we didn't know what to say? Difficult conversations can be, well, difficult to have, and certainly they can be tough to start. So what is the right approach to have when it comes to sparking meaningful conversations or discussions about mental health or physical health or grief? That's where Riaz comes in. When you conduct thousands of interviews over a two-decade span like Riaz, you learn how to get to the heart of things. You learn what to say, and perhaps more importantly, how to listen. The last few years haven't been easy for most of us, including Riaz. And he's joining us to pass on lessons he's learned about social connection during the pandemic, as well as how tragic loss compelled him to prioritize his health and that of his family's. Manage your stress, not the other way around. For simple ways to improve your mental health, check out the free MindFit Toolkit from the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. Complete a self-assessment, access virtual counseling, and learn more about how anxiety, stress, or depression might be impacting your health. Go to menshealthfoundation.ca and access the MindFit Toolkit to start improving your mental wellness today. Riaz, uh, I think the last time I saw you in person prior to this was at City TV. Mm. You were still a host. And here we are. A short time later, you're a author, keynote speaker. You're no longer with City Television. How the heck did you get here? <laughs> Leap of faith. Yeah. Leap of faith. I guess that was 2019. Last time I saw you when, you know, we had the chance to collaborate and... I mean, look at these past two years for all of us, the amount of reflection that goes on and discovery of purpose. I think that's the number one thing of how you transition out of what was happening before of interviewing people for a living. It's still weird being on the other side. I remember I would be interviewing you, asking you all the questions, and and now here I am um, hopefully answering and providing value for, for you today, but just getting clear on, on purpose and how I could serve in this space of relationships and, and just meaningful human connection. We're going to dig into that in a moment, but first I want to give you congratulations. Latest champion for the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. Yeah. Um, what made you want to get involved in this? This was a no-brainer for me. And looking at the message of, I mean, I even look at the slogan, don't change much in the need, uh, especially with mental health right now and looking at some of these studies over the past couple of years of how mental health has declined. There's so many out there, yet are the conversations happening of how we struggle most? Are we opening up in, in deeper ways? So when, when this opportunity came up, I jumped at it because there's mental health, there's physical health, but also the avenue of social health that gets overlooked. And are we opening up, getting past the stigmas of, hey, look, and my work you know, delves into isolation and loneliness. Look, I've got nobody to talk to. That can be a hard thing to say and admit. And I wanted to enter the conversation and help provide some insights of how we get past that and how we just start to connect again. Well, then what does don't change much mean to you? Because I think it has different meanings for anyone that looks at it. I appreciate the simplicity of it, that less is more. Because in this age that we're living in, especially the remote era setups, we're like overwhelmed with distraction right now and thinking we have so many more responsibilities to try and juggle things, to make it all work, get through the day, and then thinking, I've got a huge to-do list. And then what happens when most of us get overwhelmed? We shut down and nothing gets done. So the simplicity of don't change much and maybe start with just one or two things to create this positive change, that strikes a chord with me of how we just simplify and start to create uh, meaningful relationships. I think meaningful relationships start with meaningful conversations, probably. 
you've got a book out, which we'll get to in, in one more question, but previously you were a host on television. I think you went to school to be a broker. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> Once upon a time, yes. Yeah, and Simon then Fraser University. Investment left broker. turn in the TV. Yeah. Right. And you were a host and known for many things, but I think especially your interviewing style, your conversational style of getting people to talk. Was that kind of the genesis of every conversation counts? Did you have a moment you went, wait a second, not only am I getting information, I'm learning something myself in these interviews? Mm. There was a moment that stood out to me about this message of really crafting and defining this principle that I live by, that every conversation counts. And in 2012, I was invited to do a TED Talk at TEDxSFU. And for me, that was a proud moment, going through the finance route, defecting, and then being invited back. And three days before this uh, talk happened, a good friend of mine, Sam, reached out and said, hey, I I'm sure you've got a, a lot of great stories to share, much as you, as, as you Murph, have from interviewing all these interesting figures over the years. But he said, what's the title of your talk going to be? And that moment really made me stop and think, what is the message behind this talk? Because anyone could go up there and share stories, but what is the message I wanted to leave, the through line I wanted to leave the audience with? And it's these three words that every conversation counts. And it's almost a gut check time because you're like, why do I wake up at 3.30 in the morning to do a morning show? Like, what is the, there is a driving factor. Everyone would say to me, like, how do you do it? I'm like, when you love it, when you're connected to it, you find a way. And that was the title of that talk. And it made me realize that for years, I would always be taking notes. Like the two most common characteristics of all leaders, whether leaders, athletes, philanthropists, celebrities, the most successful ones always had two things in common, discipline and humility. And as a host, it was always just maintaining a beginner's mindset. No matter who came in, suspend my assumptions, suspend my judgment, which took a lot of time because I, I would make the critical mistake in the beginning of my career of, okay, I've researched this person. I've got a list of questions. The interview was a success because I asked all of these questions and I missed out on the moment of that person sharing what matters most to them. So that exercise of asking questions and then just documenting all of these interesting insights and moments that people would share and then seeing the reaction of how they moved the room or moved the audience, that inspired me. And I always just thought, hey, what if one day we leaned into this message of human connection? Because when people connect, Amazing things can happen. So when did the light bulb go off then of really listening? And not, I mean, obviously you prepare for interviews and you write questions down. Yeah. And, and there's certain topics you have to hit. But when did the light bulb go off that sometimes you have to change course? You have to listen to what your subject is talking about. You have to connect on that level and take the conversation somewhere else because that's where they're opening the door. You know, one one of the biggest moments, and I credit the Tree Livings for this and their courage, and this is a heavy conversation, but it was in December, or no, uh, fall of 2017, and the Tree Livings were chair of a campaign, Canada 150, of 150 mental health champions that had overcome adversity. And I'd never met them before. You know, done the research. Everybody knew Jim from Dragon's Den, Boston Pizza, uh, the success with the business. His wife, Sandy, I mean, she is such a powerful force for good uh, as, as, as the director on the board for Cam H. And they came into the green room. We exchanged formalities. And then Sandy literally stopped and said, uh, Riaz, what are you going to ask me when we go out there? Because I'm kind of nervous right now. Mm -hmm. And I looked at both of them and I thought, what? But then I realized I had made assumptions that, you know what? They look like they've got everything they need. But this comment was she needed a safe space. And I kind of leaned in asked them a couple more questions, understood why this message was so important to them because creating that safe space is so important, whether you're doing live TV or you're one-on-one -on -one with anybody to lift them up. And then when the camera started rolling, I mean, Sandy told her story about her brother who lived with schizophrenia. That was expected and how that impacted him, how that impacted her family. But Jim surprised us all because he talked about his former life as an RCMP officer in Alberta. And he said at the time, he saw these challenges with mental health that weren't being addressed. Yet in his own life, and this is why Don't Change Much is so valuable to me because we get overwhelmed with all of the things we need to do. And Jim said there was a conversation he had with his nephew who was maybe 16, 17 years old at the time. And his nephew came up to him and said, hey, Uncle Jim, can I use your gun to go hunting? And Jim said, fine, he obliged. And it turns out his nephew used Jim's gun to take his own life. And I had never heard that story. I had no idea Jim was going to go there. And we're live on television. And I'm like, wow. And as you can imagine, we could hear a pin drop in that studio, but then I always remember the question Jim followed up with that sticks with me to this day, especially coming out of this pandemic. 
He said, Riaz, how did I fail to recognize the signs? How did I fail to see the signs? And it's a question I think we can all ask ourselves with the people in our life because there, there's a difference. And I, I believe we've understood the difference between friends and acquaintances right now over these past two years of who showed up for you. And some people will say, I, I saw the post on social media. I know what's going on in your life, but do you really? Mm -hmm. Because some people won't be forthcoming with the challenges. They'll just show you what's good on social. How do you create those? I mean, that was for television. Um, lights are on. You've got um, you know, high-profile figures. How do you create those safe spaces just for friends? That you might be super tight with someone, but you don't have those real deep conversations. And if you feel like there's something that needs to be talked about, how do you open that door to someone that, you know, guys don't always like to talk about stuff. Mm. So how do you create that that safe space just in everyday life, a conversation? If Especially in these days, we don't have that much time for anyone. Two words come to mind. Go first. And if I look at the opportunity to, to help motivate somebody, go first, find out what motivates them, help them achieve that. If I want to create this safe space one-on-one, -on -one, I'll go first and share a piece of my humanity and what I've been through to show, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you, Murph. And you may not react right away and, and, and reciprocate, but you'll know that I've put this out here and I'm consistent with that gesture. So they'll know when their time is right. Because some people ask me, they're like, well, how do you break down somebody's emotional barriers? And I laugh at this question. I'm like, how do you break down somebody's barriers? That sounds so aggressive. But how do we just meet people where they're at? And if we go first, give a piece of ourselves and ultimately ask first and talk second, I think it's so important because I find people have a pure intent to help others, to serve, to lift them up if they're struggling, especially on the mental health side. But sometimes we try to find the perfect thing to say to make somebody feel good. And sometimes they just need to be hurt. So I think it's, it's, it's the willingness, the courage to go first if you want to create this safe space. And then two, being intentional about asking before uh, you know we're doing all the talking. We'll circle back around to this type of conversation just as it pertains to grief. I want to get to that in a moment. But first... You know, how did the pandemic shape how you approach these conversations or how did it shape just your overall career and the changing of messaging with what happened at the start of the pandemic? Mm. Or did it? The pandemic, I, well, I feel it created a sense of urgency because if the message, when, when I would talk about this idea of loneliness or isolation, and, you know, I, I credit U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy for I think he's got the most concise description of loneliness. I mean, you have intimate loneliness if you know you lack partnership, relational if you if you feel like you don't have a quality support group of friends, collective loneliness if you're missing that affiliation with a group or association, and ultimately isolation, which we all felt firsthand. And then on the flip side, some people will say, "Well, solitude's a good thing." I mean, if you were at home during the pandemic with the family, having some solitude was was really important to recharge. But I felt like the pandemic, looking at these aspects of loneliness and, and how they impact us, created a sense of urgency uh, with the human connection piece. Because we realized that it's not an option, like it's a necessity. The pandemic was almost a reveal of how important social health is. We talk about physical health, mental health, but a lot of people don't talk about social health. And when that was stripped away and then given to you in a 2D experience through a screen where nobody's making eye contact and you're like, what is this? This pandemic, I think, created space to recalibrate. It was like we were all born again with this universal restarting line of uncertainty. It was our, it was our, our universal commonality of what's going to happen here. And instead of just talking about the weather or talking about the pandemic, we went deeper. And we started talking about what's really going on in our lives. And I hope this sticks around, that we get past the surface BS and just talk about, hey, what, what's really happening with People were lonely and isolated before the pandemic, you yeah. know, but obviously the pandemic brought a whole bunch more people into that space, unfortunately. Yeah. Is it still a problem for those people that they were introduced to it uh, against their will, so to speak, now that the pandemic is apparently behind us and, and things are back to normal in quotations? This is such an important question to ask because everyone has talked about our physical health with the physical impact of COVID, but the mental health impact 
I believe is about to unfold in the months and years ahead. To truly understand, I mean, one of the most recent studies I was looking at, it came out in May of 2022 by the American Psychological Association. 34 uh, studies were done, 200,000 participants across four continents, including North America and Europe, and they found there were many variables, but a 5% increase in overall loneliness. And what that means and how that shows up, it's so personal. I mean, this could elevate stress anxiety, depression. We know that disrupts sleep. That shows up how you know we operate on a day-to-day basis. I think it's a difficult question to answer right now at this point in 2022 as we record this. And depending on when you're listening to this, it's going to be an evolving thing. And I, I think the important aspect we all need to do is break out of autopilot mode and get intentional with how we check in with one another, how we're asking these questions, how we're listening to each other. And above, uh, above all, how we're asking for help, which can be a very difficult thing for some people. Well, how do you then? I mean, if if someone is suffering from loneliness and, you know, th- there's not always time to have the physical connection. I can't always go to someone's house, especially if they live somewhere else. Twofold, how can I offer help if I'm not physically there? Or on the flip side, how can I ask for help if I need it? You know, I, I think about the position of if I am struggling, what's the first thing you can do? Help others so you can help yourself. Because if I'm struggling and you reach out to me, Murph, and you're trying to lift me up and I'm not providing any value into the equation, that's not going to solve the problem. At some point, I'm going to start to feel like I'm just a drain on you. So finding these opportunities and it's, I mean, it goes back to the slogan, not changing much, the simplicity of, hey, I'm going to help my neighbor take out the trash. I'm going to take their dog for a walk. I'm going to pick their kids up from daycare. These simple things elevate a sense of purpose Because if you're lonely and you're feeling isolated, you're not connected to anyone. And then you almost retreat instead of reaching out. But if you can re-energize that sense of these these little things to build momentum with purpose, finding ways you can help others. And there's so many great organizations and associations to do that. If you're in the position of reaching out to ask somebody, being willing to just be uncomfortable in the space, being okay with silence and just being like, hey, Murph, I... Let's hang. I'm just here to sit with you and ask some questions. And if you need a moment, if you want to sit in silence, being okay with that. I feel like if we want to help, being intentional with slowing things down because everything moves so fast. And I'll give you an example. Like in this virtual space, the meetings we have, they're productive, they're efficient, they're economical because it's more accessible for everybody across the country or across the world to join but they move. Sometimes they can move too fast where we forget the idea of checking in with someone. And in many ways, efficiency, this culture of efficiency we're in now can be the enemy of human connection. Because if we just get straight through the agenda, hey, Murph, thanks. Okay, see you later. Someone will feel like, well, I would have loved to share something. And for all of us, if we're running that meeting, thinking about on Mondays, hey, Ben's going to start and talk about what he's grateful for. Fridays, what was your biggest win of the week? Tell me your, your favorite story to ignite that sense of emotion. And we have these moments of humanity. They don't have to be long, but just small pockets where we're getting intentional of creating space for people to share. And when we do, really lean into it as opposed to, next, let's get to the agenda. How much does the definition of meaningful human connection change from one person to person and how do you recognize what they might need? Mm, so subjective. I mean, the idea of loneliness, how do you define that? That's the perceived lack of meaningful social connection. That definition is going to be different for every single person. So I think it starts with, you know, asking the question of what does your ideal scenario look like? What do you feel you have right now? Tell me something good about what's making you happy. Tell me something that you feel you need right now. And us asking the questions, I think, is really important than making the assumption of they have with any, which is why I bring up that tree living story. I had the assumption that they were good, but I had to check myself and recognize, no, this is a different space and everyone will need something different. I think most of us are shaped by our experiences, right? And I'd say probably over the last three plus years, you've gone through a roller coaster of experiences, birth of your first child, Mm. a a career change, a pandemic, the loss of not just one parent, but both parents 
suddenly. Did each one of those things affect you differently? Did you have time to really think about those things and reconcile those things as they came along? Or was it just a three-year period and at the end when you just went, what the heck happened and, and how do I build myself up from this? Mm. To be honest, I think I'm still reconciling it all. Because when it happens, for the parent listening to this, you can take all the courses you want and then the baby comes into the world and you're like, what the heck? I wasn't ready for this. And then you understand the struggles and joys of parenting and every day is an adventure. The pandemic, we're still making sense of it all. You know, how we function, how we travel, every single thing we do now, there's an inherent risk of, if I go to this event, will I need to isolate? It's different. We didn't think about these things before. And when you have loss of life, a lot of people don't talk about the logistics you have to take care of when you lose somebody, which becomes a huge distraction to actual grieving. And one of the things I've come to appreciate, a piece of advice that was given to me, or maybe not advice, but perspective, that death is a date on the calendar, but grief, grief is the calendar. And in any day, any moment, it can hit you. Like I was doing a keynote last weekend for... Uh, a great group of leaders with Cal Tire. And this is 90% men in the room. So I was wondering, how is this message of human connection going to land? Because the presentation before me was all about like this automation and AI. And I'm like, this is a huge turn. But as we went deeper into the presentation and their willingness to share, I could see the emotion on their eyes. Like Murph, I literally, for the first time in my entire life, I credit this group. There were 70 leaders in the room. We talked about grief. We talked about connection. Their emotion brought me to tears. Like the lower lip quiver, ugly cry. Like I was in front of all of them doing that. And I honestly had to check myself because at the end of it, uh, a gentleman came up to me and he had tears in his eyes and he looked at me and he said, you know, thank, thank you for introducing this perspective and, and creating a safe space to have this conversation around grief. And I just kind of laughed because I've never lost it like that. And he just, I said to him, I was like, hey, next time I do this, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and, you know, keep myself together. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, don't. He's like, what you gave us was a beautiful piece of yourself. It's what we all needed in this room. And, and that humanity and what I'm seeing with audiences that come into the space and, and are willing to engage with human connection, it is powerful because everyone has a lot to share right now. And I feel like they just, they just need someone to create that space for them to, to open up and, and share something meaningful. How do you create that space then? Because I think a lot of times when you know someone who's lost someone close to them, a loved one, a parent, you want to say something, right? And you want to say the right thing, but a lot of times it comes out as canned or flat. You know, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, you're in my prayers. Um, Thoughts and prayers. They're yeah, in a better cultures. place. Like just things that you like, you say it and you almost cringe that you're saying it because you don't know a better thing to say. And I'll, and I'll I'll bring up a, a situation I had um, and, I'll, and I'll share it because he's shared it. But Corey Hirsch had someone close to him pass when we were on the road in Florida. Yeah. And John Shorthill has been Brown. They did, you know, they, they lifted him up, tried to get him ready to fly back to Phoenix. I flew with him from Florida to Phoenix uh, to get him to where he had to be. And it was a four and a half hour flight, I think, maybe five hours. And I'm sitting beside Corey, who's understandably emotional, like he's a mess. And I had no idea how to console him. I didn't know if he wanted to be consoled. So I don't know if we were a half hour in the flight or 40 minutes. I finally said, I don't know what to say. Mm. If you want to talk to me, I'm here. If you want to go to sleep, let me know. I don't know how to deal with it. So however you'd like this to look, let me know and I'll do my best to do it. And it kind of seemed like Man, what, I'm an idiot. But maybe sometimes you have to let them lead in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate your honesty in sharing this because acknowledging it is one thing. I mean, I think that's the first step. A lot of people will say, well, I don't want to trigger that person. So I'm not going to bring it up. I'm just going to talk about happy things. But I have personally found that is the worst thing that, that, that you could receive because it feels like when someone dies, especially if it's a loved one or, you know, in, in my case, when it was both parents, your world stops, but the world around you keeps moving. And if someone is doing that, I know that they're trying to make you feel better, but it feels awkward because you feel like it's not even acknowledged and you feel even more isolated and alone. So the fact you did that to call it out 
I think it's beautiful because some, some people aren't equipped to do it. I'll tell you one of the greatest things that uh, I have learned of what to say to somebody that is grieving, and I credit Deb Davison, who is the lead counselor at Canuck Place Children's Hospice. Every year they have the annual gala. Actually, I guess they do too, and I'm lucky enough to, to host their Canuck Place Gift of Love Gala on Abbotsford. And four months removed from my dad's sudden passing, I'm literally, I'm sitting at this round table and Deb Davison's beside me. The parents who have lost their child are getting ready to go up to take the stage and share this speech. And I had never dealt with grief before. And I realized two things in this moment. When, when you're faced with it, you realize how resilient you can be. But secondly, I realized I'm like, I failed every single person that ever lost somebody because I shied away from the conversation. I didn't lean in when they needed it most. And I, I looked at Deb and I was struggling with my own grief. And I just said, I'm like, Deb, what, what, do you, what is the best thing you could say or do and it, it, to just lift somebody up? And she kind of smiled and she looked at me and she said, Riaz, it's not about what you can say. Because they do, we, well, what do we do? We do that exact same thing that you described. Thoughts and prayers, my condolences, let me know if you need anything. And then we step back and that person's left all alone. And she said, it's not about what you can say, it's about what you can ask. And I said, what's the best question you can ask somebody? And then she just smiled and I credit her because she's got a heart of gold. And she said, ask them this, what do you want me to know about them? Like, what do you want me to know about them? And the moment, Murph, she said that to me, Man, I looked at her. I'm like, this is one of the greatest gifts anyone has ever given me because this question is such a beautiful invitation for someone to share a piece of who that person was. Maybe a story, maybe a moment, a piece of that legacy, but it creates the space for someone to open up. And I can tell you, I, I, that conversation happened in February of 2020. Every single person that has lost somebody after we reach out and I know they're in a space because you got to read them too. Are they, are, are they in a space where you know they're, they're willing to talk? I mean, if they're posting it on social media, to me, that, that's almost a cry for help. Like they, they want to be lifted up. Every single person I've asked that question to has given me a beautiful glimpse of who that person was, followed by two words. Thank you. After going through what you went through, whether it was after your father passed or after your, your mom passed away shortly after, was there someone that was able to help you through those traumatic times, those difficult times, and, and lift you up, as you say, uh, needs to be done uh, when someone's going through a tough time. You know what's, what's, what's interesting about this question, reflecting on it? Yes, there was somebody clearly, and you know this person very well, Murph. It was your wife. 24 hours after her dad died, uh, Christy reached out to me. And I remember she described it like you're going through waves of grief because she was talking about the experience of losing her father. And she said, it's like you're in the water, you're in the ocean and these waves come crashing down on you and you can't breathe. But then your head pops up and these waves will come again, they'll come again, they'll come again, but you will build your resilience. And when mom died, she reached out again, man. And I said to her, I was like, wow, man. You are an incredible human being. And I let her know and I just said, I'll never forget the message you sent me with dad because he gave me such perspective on how to handle this. And you're here again. And I have nothing but gratitude for your beautiful soul. And I let her know that and it just makes me think, man, the work you're doing with this podcast, the partner you get to have in your life, I'm grateful for her. And if you're listening to this thinking, what, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing. When somebody reaches out just to let you know that they're thinking about you, it can make a world of difference. And your wife, Christy, did that for me. I don't want to gloss over this, but I think that w in your case, you had to grieve your your parents, but the manner in which they passed, yeah, cardiac issues, yeah. correct? Correct. That would have forced you not only to grieve, but to reflect on how you're living your life, prioritizing not mental health, but physical health as well. Mm. What steps did you and your family take to make sure you were living the right way? And, and was there 
tangible changes. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, these moments are humbling where I begin to reflect and I'm like, when we get together for family events, I'm like, why do we just eat garbage? Like, sure, it tastes good. But every time we go, I'm like, oh, I need to prepare my body for the food we're about to eat. <laughs> you know, so, South Asian culture, I mean, my, my, my parents came from East Africa. So when they came to Canada in the, in the 70s, I am humbled by the fact they came to this country with a couple hundred bucks in their pocket and they created this beautiful life for us. Yet they worked so hard and they hustled so hard. There was never a point where, hey, I need to get proactive about taking care of my health. They just got through it. And then all of a sudden, over the past few years, like my dad had quintuple bypass surgery. I remember when the surgeon walked out, I'm like, quintuple? You do five? He's like, yeah, no problem. Like it was just another day at the office. I'm like, what is happening right now? And then a year later, he had to have a stent. And, you know, I'll never forget a moment where I came home. Like we grew up in, in Delta, British Columbia. I came home. My dad was sitting at the kitchen table and he just looked angry. And this was past his surgeries. And he said, listen to this voicemail because he, he had to have some blood work to, to, to follow up. It was a, more of a reactive approach. And the person that left the message that said, sir, we think you've had another heart attack. Uh, we need you to come back to the hospital. And he was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is it. It's over. And it's such a different reality. I, I'm imagining like it, it, when you're younger, if something happens to you and you're in good health, your body will heal. But when you get to the point where it's just deteriorating, there's only so much you can do. And I think that's the position both of my parents were in. So watching that reality for them and then the ultimate loss, when I lost my dad, uh, I got very urgent with reaching out to doctors about heart disease. I now have an endocrinologist that checks my blood levels because my dad was type 2, type 2 diabetes, and I'm in the gray area. So we do check-ins every three months to monitor it. I have a nutritionist that that caters the diet to um, the predisposition DNA wise of what I'm prone to, uh, to make sure that I can control what I can control. You know, there are going to be factors given my DNA that are out of my control, but if I'm lucky enough to live, you know, 20, 30 more years, I want it to be a good quality of life. So I've started living in a much more intentional way and in getting proactive with these check-ins. I was going to say, so your message would be to become proactive when it comes to, you know, obviously mental health, physical health. Yeah. For me, what's helped is, is get a coach and stay coachable. Whether that's, hey, a personal trainer, they're going to coach you. A nutrition coach, they're going to coach you. A doctor, uh, endocrinologist, they're going to tell you, here are the things that are driving your your you know blood sugars. You ultimately, you're in control of what you're putting in your body. You're in control of how you're moving your body. How do you want to live? And you can't measure that progress unless you're intentional with checking in with these people, doing these tests to understand. And I never did that before. I took it for granted. No, no, it's very different. Was your wife open to it too? Same avenues? Yeah. She's, she's been doing the exact same thing. In fact, she, she had something recently done called a pre-nuvo scan. I didn't even know what that was, but it, it's a significant investment. But it, it, from head to toe, they scan your body and she detected she has something wrong with her spine and she's going to have to have surgery to correct it. And she just thought, oh, I slept incorrectly. And they're like, no, you have a significant issue. And they detected a lump in her breast. And we just discovered, thankfully, that uh, it wasn't serious and it hadn't spread. But the mammogram didn't pick that up. But her intention to kind of look at health and how everything's changing so quickly was, I know it's expensive and I'm going to save my money and do this because I want to make sure I'm okay and I can be a great mom to our son. And I'm, I'm grateful she did that because you never know what could be going on with your body. name of the book, Riaz, Every Conversation Counts. So that conversation could be deep. It could be lighthearted. It could be funny. It could be long. It could be short. Mm -hmm. Your message to the listeners just about making conversation with the goal of making meaningful relationships and creating real, you know, human contact. Yeah. And I, I think, if, you know, some people ask me, well, how do you make every conversation count? I think it's just acknowledging somebody's truth before you speak your own. Thank you for listening, and a big thanks to everyone who already follows. If you haven't yet, click the follow button on your podcast app so you don't miss upcoming episodes. 
and special guests. Join us every month for a new installment of the Don't Change Much podcast. And if you're new to the show, be sure to check out previous episodes with guests including John Herdman, Kelly Rudy, Trevor Linden, and more. For more helpful tips on improving your mental and physical health, visit mensheallfoundation.ca and don'tchangemuch.ca.